Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our talk back with uh, Philly DA about this amazing new docu-series that's going to be uh, premiering on PBS. My name is Jennifer Saletti. I am the Director of Training and Communications for the New Jersey Office of the Public Defender, where I work on policy issues such as bail reform, police reform, and decarceration, many of the themes that uh, we you've already seen in, in the first episode of this docu-series. I want to briefly introduce you to our panel. They are a distinguished group, but I'm gonna keep these short, these introductions short, so that we can get right to our conversation tonight. Um, first, the man of the hour, Larry Krasner, who is the Philly DA. He was formerly a civil rights and criminal defense lawyer who shocked the nation when he won his seat for district attorney in Philadelphia and ushered in this modern era of the progressive prosecutor. So thank you for being with us. Uh, with us also is Mike Lee. Mike is an assist the Assistant District Attorney and Director of Legislation and Government Affairs, and also the Supervisor of Adult Diversion for the District Attorney of Philadelphia. We also have joining us on our panel, award-winning filmmaker and video artist, Ted Passan. Ted created and directed Philly DA, along with his fellow creators, co-director Yoni Brook and producer Nicole Salazar. And last, but certainly not least, we have Judge Mark Bernstein, who served as a judge of the first judicial circuit in Pennsylvania for, I'm sorry, the District of Pennsylvania for more than 30 years. So welcome everyone to our panel and thank you so much for being with us. And to everyone at home, thank you so much for joining us and, and watching and being here for this really important conversation. So I want to start and kind of get right to the heart of this first episode, uh, revolution, social experiment, anarchy. Those were just some of the words we heard in that first episode used to describe um, Larry Krasner becoming the DA uh, in Philadelphia. And I think that they really encompass this sort of feeling, the mixed array of feelings around this notion of progressive prosecutors. As a person who's been a lifelong public defender, I tell you, I struggled with this a little bit myself with this idea of whether you can really change a system for the in, from the inside out or whether that's a myth. So my first question goes to you, Larry, and that's, it is, is, are, are you able to change a broken justice system from the inside out, or are you just another in a line of prosecutors who thinks you know better about who should go to jail and for how long? Um, Jennifer, first of all, thank you for the work you do. I used to do some of that work. I was a public defender five years, and then I was a criminal defense attorney who did a lot of court appointed work at times for another 25. And I mean it sincerely, thank you for the work you do. But I have to tell you, I became dissatisfied with that work when I was approaching my mid fifties, because I felt like I got a lot of, I got a lot of justice for individuals in certain cases, but the entire time the system was getting worse. Uh, you know, I say this, I don't, I'm, without any intent to accuse or point, but when I was a defense attorney, a public defender, we didn't fix the system. You know, we weren't driving the train. There was a valid criticism that we were helping or maybe we were just the conductors because you couldn't convict people and give them a million years without an attorney standing next to them. And that, that really troubled me. It troubled me that what I viewed as being the wrong people had all the power. Uh, and, you know, and so my somewhat unlikely decision to run late in life for that particular job was all about trying to take the power away from people who had given us mass incarceration. Can you do something? I would say so. You know, if we look at the number of years of future prison and jail generated in Philadelphia as of right before the pandemic, meaning the court system in Philly right before the pandemic, it was half as many years of incarceration as in a prior administration. When you look at excessive supervision on probation and parole, and Philly was the worst of the 10 largest cities for this, we cut it by two thirds. You know, when you look at protecting immigrants' rights, we did it. We broke a, a contract that lasted 10 years with the vote of a mayor and were able to protect immigrants as witnesses, as victims, but also treat them fairly as defendants. We're protecting workers now. These are all new things that happen, these, these, these directions. And, um, you know, I, I think that the work that public defenders do and defense attorneys do is incredibly important. But I think it's fair to say it wasn't fixing things systemically. We had become the most incarcerated country in the world, despite the, you know, the open hearts and the bright minds and the incredible hard work and talent of people like you and like me 
And uh, Judge Bernstein, were you a public defender? I can't remember. Yes, you were. I thought so. But I, I, you know, I just had to admit at a certain point in my life that I felt like um, I, I'd gotten individual change, but I wanted sweeping change. And, and I've had this wonderful opportunity to try to get some of it. Thanks. My, my next question is for, for you, Mike. Um, you know, as a, a person, a senior member of this administration kind of coming in and in your back end, from what I understand, is um, civil rights and public defense as well. Uh, Coming in, you know, I, I often hear this expression when you're doing reform work, culture eats policy for breakfast, right? You can make all the policies you want, but if the culture in the place where you're trying to set those policies is um, against you, you're going to have a hard time making a massive cultural shift. And in the, the first episode, we see that you did let go of some prosecutors who you thought were not going to be able to sort of flip that switch and, and to be as reform minded as you all were. So my question for you is for those people who remain, those people who were career prosecutors and remained in the prosecutor's office, how did you make that cultural shift? What were your biggest challenges in, in, in shifting the mindset of people and kind of getting them to see that there was a new way of doing things and it just might work? Uh, good evening, Jennifer. And thank you for such a great question. Uh, I believe culture is two parts. The people and its artifacts, right? And artifacts are how you dress, what you write, the things that you value in your culture or society, um, as we often conflate the two things. But <clears throat> essentially, the culture change was two steps. One, bringing in, uh, recruiting class after class of progressive-minded people who, like myself or like the DA, uh, wouldn't have seen themselves in the role of a prosecutor before, but realizing the opportunity to seize power and effectuate change. And the second thing uh, towards that culture is really changing the artifacts and the things that we value within the office and how we measure success or uh, help people advance through their careers. And historically that was associated with how many convictions you got, how long someone was incarcerated for, and over time, because cultures don't change overnight, we have started to change that value system, change the conversations around uh, how we uh, value our work product from seeking convictions towards seeking justice. And sometimes justice is a conviction that requires incarceration. And sometimes justice is a diversion like the uh, 15 programs that I run. And sometimes justice is uh, declining a case. And again, that speaks to the type of power that is unique to the prosecutor and how we're helping people understand how to use that power as a sword to protect the public, but also as a shield uh, to protect the integrity of our system. Um, so it is an ongoing battle to try to change the culture. And I think that if you don't pay attention to the culture, then it can eat the policies um, because it's up to the culture to reinforce that artifact of writing down what our values are and how we're supposed to think through our decision-making. Right. I, I wanna talk a little bit um, about some of the policy changes that you made early on. And this question is actually going to go to Ted, um, but framed um, against the backdrop of the work that you've done on police and prosecutorial misconduct. Um, I remember being across the river and hearing about the day you released the do not call list. And, New Jersey has, has not done a great job with police transparency. So I was rooting for you um, from across the river. Um, and that was a big moment. And that was 2018. And, and Ted, most of this documentary was shot in 2018 uh, before George Floyd's death and before this sort of national acceptance of this conversation about police misconduct. So I, I am going to kick it back to, to Larry and Mike in a little while to talk a little bit about their police reform efforts. But as, as a starting point, Ted, I'm just curious if you were making this documentary now, today, would things be different? Would you frame any of the police misconduct discussion or, or how you shot this film differently in the wake of George Floyd and this very public conversation about police misconduct? Um, are there differences that you're seeing between 2018 and 2020 and would that have affected your filmmaking? Uh, that's a great question. And hello, and thank you for having me here. Um, 
Yeah, you know, uh, honestly, I mean, you know, because we were still in the wake of Ferguson when we were filming. And so I do feel like there, there you know, that was the a, a really big step in kind of mainstreaming the concept around police brutality. I don't know that our filming would have changed, but I actually think that the process of funding and making the series on that side likely would have changed because in the beginning when we were, you know, you know, when you're, when you're doing an independent project like this, you know, we started off applying for, you know, first self-financing and then applying for grants and then getting the grants. And then after you have enough, you start going to networks. And when we would go to distributors in the beginning, we, it would always go the same way where people were like, Oh, you know, this looks really interesting and compelling, but do audiences really care about these issues? Like, do they really want to see a bunch of lawyers sitting in a room and talking, which, you know, on its face does not sound like the best pitch. Um, but nobody asks us that question anymore, you know, like, uh, you know, now suddenly it was really interesting to be standing in the same place that you were before. And suddenly everyone's like, well, I don't know, is this? And then, and now people are like, oh, you're so cutting edge. You're so like of the moment. And we were just doing the same thing, you know, but, but I, I think, I think one thing, you know, about police brutality, if you like look at the history of it and how many, how many, you know, I mean, even just in the city of Philadelphia, how many kind of landmark cases or incidents in it, you know, it's, it's, it's very dependable, you know, and it's something that's gonna, that comes back until we really deal with it as a society. And so it is something that I think when you're really paying attention to the issue, you know, you can kind of set your watch by it because there's always going to be a big scandal, a big thing that happens every couple of years in the city. Um, but, but, but for what it's worth, it is great to see that that conversation is becoming more mainstream, that it's becoming more accepted, that it's becoming more um, nuanced. Um, you know, and I think before the conversation went from whoever was, whoever was on the receiving end of that brutality, you know, having to prove, you know, that, you know, it was, it was always like about character assassination. And I think we're finally, the conversation starting to move past that. And now to be, to people starting to see it as this relentless problem that needs to be addressed in a systemic way. Um, yeah. So like I said, I, I don't know that, I don't know that our filmmaking approach necessarily would have, would have been any different. I, the only thing that, maybe there would have been I, actually something that we tried to do in the series was actually to you know we we tried to see if we could tell a story of someone who an officer who was on the list where in a specific case where you know somebody was wrongfully imprisoned or or something else happened because of the conduct on the list but we ended up not being able to find one where we could somebody wanted to be on camera um but that's maybe the only thing different so. So my next, my next question is for Judge Bernstein. Um, Your Honor, at the core of this film is really an exploration of prosecutorial power and discretion. Um, and prosecutors in our system um, have an enormous amount of power as, as everyone at home saw in the film from making charging decisions to deciding plea offers to um, deciding to reduce mandatory minimum terms, all sorts of, of, of things within the prosecutor's control. And you were a judge for 30 years. So I wanna ask you, regardless of whether or not we're happy with the way a DA is wielding power, do prosecutors have too much power in the American legal system? And what can we do potentially to balance out the power? Wow, thank you. Um... Do they have too much power? I have never thought about that because I grew up in a system where they have this power, uh, plain and simple. In Europe, it's the judges who do the prosecuting and they have the power. Uh, I think a, a, a more significant question is how district attorneys use that power and change or maintain the culture uh, as a judge, the culture in the criminal courts that I grew up with was lock them up for as long as you possibly can reasonably do. And Larry started changing the culture as soon as he started running. I went as a judge, went as a citizen and a judge, went to a public forum 
where all the DA candidates were speaking, at least the Democratic ones. And I don't remember whether there were six or seven or eight, but it was a, a huge panel. And fully expecting from uh, watching district attorney candidates for 40 or 45 years, the line being, I'm tough, tougher than any of them. I will lock them up more and for longer. And Larry Krasner taking the exact opposite approach that the system is, is damaged and has to change, suddenly none of them talked about being tougher and locking up people longer. He changed the culture, at least in the way they talked. I don't know what they would have done if they had become DA in the way they talked right in the campaign that you could no longer simply say, I'm going to lock people up more than the guy, longer than the guy to my left or to my right. Uh, the DA has tremendous uh, power in, in prosecuting, in deciding what to prosecute, in determining the charges. One of our prior DAs would always go for the death penalty because it gave an advantage in jury selection. And then after the death penalty available jury was selected, would then drop the death penalty. It's a tremendous difference that the district attorney can make. Do I think it, the DA has too much power? I guess I don't. The judge has the final say in a lot of things, but the DA has uh, the final say up until it turns to the judge. You know, just keeping with this for a moment, because I'm curious to get Larry's thoughts on this. I'll tell you the the line that it was echoing over and over and over in my brain when I watched this, the first episode of the film was when you said it was nice to have power instead of outrage. And I just imagined myself as a lifelong public defender in this position now to finally make some changes in a system that I've been complaining about my entire career. Um, and at the same time, it's so fleeting because as I said earlier, it's really who wields the power, can wield that power to, to do what I perceive to be things that are good and, and many people are perceiving to be progressive reforms. Um, what are your thoughts on this? And what can we do to ensure that the positive reforms that you are attempting to enact last long after your tenure as prosecutor, as DA, however, however long that may be? So, um, you know, I think the really good news about the film, but also the really good news about what's happening in the DA's office is this is not really being led by progressive prosecutors. We're all getting too much credit. I, in particular, I'm getting too much credit. I mean, the fact is Dan Satterberg in Seattle and George Gascon in San Francisco and Kim Fox in Chicago, they all got there before me and Kim Gardner in St. Louis and Aramis Ayala in Orlando, they all got there before me. And, for, and, and I don't think they get the credit that they deserve for having, for having changed things. But, but the reason they got there is real simple. It is that the crushing weight of mass incarceration was so destructive to so many people that people want to change. None of us get elected on our tap dancing skills. We all got elected because what we were offering was what voters wanted. Um, if you look right now, you will find 10% of the United States of America has elected a progressive prosecutor. And that has all happened, basically all happened in the last 10 years. Think about that, 35 million people elected and in many, many cities reelected, Baltimore, Chicago, St. Louis, you know, people where poor Kim, Kim Gardner was clobbered constantly by that culture. I'm from St. Louis, so I can say that. She was clobbered constantly, but she got reelected. It's not because we tap dance so well. It's not because we're so extraordinary. We are just technicians for what is in fact a sweeping grassroots movement in the United States. And the fact that we're getting elected in these big jurisdictions means it's really more than a 10% shift because these are the jurisdictions. Los Angeles is the biggest criminal justice jurisdiction in the United States. These are the jurisdictions that can slam the brakes on mass incarceration just as fast as they were able to slam the gas and increase mass incarceration. 
Um, so I think it's really important to recognize that the core to this, these progressive prose prosecutors are to some extent irrelevant. We are simply doing what literally millions of people in this country want. They wanted it before George Floyd. They want it after George Floyd. They can be clearer about it, perhaps. But this is something that has been needed, and it was caused by exactly the kind of, of hard-nosed, hang em high prosecution that wrecked our public schools and wrecked our mental health system, wrecked economic development, all these other things that do a better job of preventing crime got wrecked so that politicians could you know, fatten their resumes on being way too cozy with notions of fear, fear, uh, politics of fear and mass incarceration. It's, um, it's happening around us. It's not happening because of us. And it's going to keep happening. And there are going to be more and more of us as we move forward. You know, the, uh, the final thing I'll say as I go through my rant about progressive prosecution is this. Democratic Party, perhaps you heard of it. They're winning what, about 50% of the time? Republican Party, perhaps you heard of them. They're winning what, about 50% of the time by cheating with gerrymandering, but they're still winning about 50% of the time. Well, in the last election cycle, the progressive prosecutor candidates won about 80% of the time. There is an argument that the most effective political party in the United States would be the one formed by all the progressive prosecutor candidates, because that's what's going on. That ain't us. That is the people. It is what the people want. They don't want the country they see now. They want one that is way less incarcerated and uses its resources in ways that are healing and that will reduce crime massively while simultaneously decarcerating. So, so, Ted, I, I just want to pick up on this point about uh, progressive prosecutors throughout the country. And Larry mentioned people like Marilyn Mosley in Baltimore and Kim Fox in Chicago and other progressive prosecutors who are women and people of color who are running prosecutors' offices. Um, and there has been some suggestion that Larry is getting a lot of share of the credit for the progressive prosecutor movement and some of these these women and other candidates have been overlooked. So my question to you is, um, why focus this document docu series on Larry Krasner? How did you land on him to be the figure through which we were going to view this this progressive or reform minded prosecutor movement? Sure, um, it is a very uncreative uh, reason, which is simply that I live in Philadelphia. And um, Larry is the DA in Philadelphia. And, you know, uh, frankly, like even if we even if we had hoped to um, replicate what we were doing with Larry with another DA somewhere else in the country, we frankly just didn't have the money to do it. You know, we were we were self-funding the project for about a year um, before any grant money came through. I mean, typically to start a documentary, you need several months of filming under your belt before you even have the materials together to even present to a grant making institution. And so it, frankly, it was just the only pragmatic way to even to make the project was just to do the one that was in our own backyard. And just coincidentally, I mean, honestly, one, one of the other reasons that we thought we could, we could pull this off is because our office just happens to be a block from the DA's office. And that literally was a factor, you know, it's like, okay, we could, I think we could afford this, you know, um, we were, we're still, scraping to get by even to do that, not paying ourselves for the first year. Um, and, but also too, it was important for us from a storytelling standpoint to do something experiential because we felt like if we had done just like a talking head documentary where you go around and have people tell you things that happened after the fact, uh, it may have been somewhat interesting, but it wouldn't have accomplished what we hoped to, which was to like immerse you in something, to put you in the to put you in the seat. There's a difference between you know hearing something in the past and then being with people in the present when they're actually trying to figure stuff out for the first time, when they're being confronted with these really big questions about how to make change and having their assumptions being challenged right on the spot. There's a really universal human experience in there that I think we can all latch on to. And it just makes everything a lot more vivid and real. And um, that's what we wanted to do. And so it had to be somewhere where we where we were. Um, um, yeah, but you know, we we wanted to make sure that we definitely acknowledged and shouted out the progressive prosecutor movement that came before Larry. So we made, you know, made sure to do that in the first episode. I mean, frankly, if we happened to have lived in a different city, it wouldn't have been Larry. It would have been whatever DA lived was in that city. Um, just happened to be Philly. Um, 
But uh, for anybody who is uh, fans of some of the other progressive prosecutors, um, in future episodes, you will see cameos by Kim Fox, uh, cameos by Rachel Rollins, uh, a cameo by Aramis Ayala. And so when possible, you know, we, we did find ways to work some of the other progressive DAs in there um, as well to, to round out the story. So um, there are questions coming in about bail. And so, and being from New Jersey, where a couple of years ago, we massively overhauled our bail system. I do have to ask about bail in Philadelphia, because you've kind of gotten some heat from both sides about your position on bail. In, in we saw in the first episode of the docuseries, we saw um, you declining to ask for any money bail on a, a group of, I think it was 33, 25 to 33, um, misdemeanors and got some heat from the cops for that. And on the other side, um, recently have you've moved to this system of asking for either a release or bails of $999,999. Um, and you've taken criticism from some of the bail funds and some progressive groups on, on the fact that this is going against the campaign promise, it's kind of taking taking us back to a situation where people who cannot afford to post bail, people of color, poor people are unable to post bail. So my question for you is why not advocate for legislative change like we saw in New Jersey, like we saw in DC, instead of sort of creating this de facto detention by asking for bails that poor people can't make? So that is a great question requiring a 1.2 hour answer, but let me try to give you a shorter one. Um, we have, I mean, I have said over and over and over again, please, Lord, give me the legislation they had in Washington, D.C. 30 years ago that says that judges cannot use money. But what a lot of people don't understand about a no cash bail system is that people are held in D.C. for 30 years. They've had a no cash bail system where 12 percent approximately of all the defendants are held and they're held pre-trial and they're held for a very good reason, which is they present such a danger to the community that that's the right thing to do. The other 88% get out and money's no part of the equation. There may be some kind of what you might call a sweat bail in the sense that some of them will have to go check in to address issues that may, invo may have involved them in the criminal justice system, addiction, homelessness, mental health issues, things like that. But money shouldn't be there. Money should never be there. The problem that we are having, which is inflaming both sides, um, is that we tried to simulate a no cash bail system in Philly, which is a cash bail system. And that meant that we went to either we're going to ask for no money or we're going to ask for a million bucks. And by the way, it's not really a million bucks. It's actually 10% of that and three and, and only a third of that if you go to a bail bondsman. So let us not get too excited by the numbers, but we did try to simulate a no cash bail system and, and to do so by saying big number or no number is what we want. Um, the system is not accepting of what we are doing. We've done a very good job actually of moving the system away from the low bails that used to keep poor people in for nonviolent, non-serious offenses. That has improved very significantly in the last three years and we're proud of that. Uh, we have had very little luck in convincing judges that when someone shoots somebody else and paralyzes them, that they should stay in custody, which is what I believe. And uh, because what actually happens is they're getting a bail on average that requires them to pay about $3,333. And we're having this happen in the middle of the biggest national spike and local, well, not local necessarily, the biggest national spike of shootings and gun homicides uh, arguably that we've seen in United States history, right? So, uh, I mean, look, for people who think no one should ever be in jail before trial, they think Ted Bundy should literally go home and do whatever he wants to until he comes back to court, they're not going to like it because we think some people should be held. Uh, for people who think everybody should be held and want to go back to mass, mass, mass incarceration, we're not with you. We think that we need to try to be surgical about this. It shouldn't be a chainsaw. But the problem is we're asking for a scalpel. We don't have one because we're in a system that is uh, drunken on cash bail. Municipalities live off of that money. They keep that money. They use it for fines and costs. They fund their budgets off of it. Private bail bondsmen or bonds people have lobbyists. They make tons of money off the private bail industry. And, you know, it, it's a, a little bit like, um, it's a little bit like just trying to wish away 
cash bail. What we really need is what Washington, D.C. did 30 years ago. And to Jersey's credit, I mean, Jersey has done a very good job. Illinois, more recently, Kentucky, this is the national trend. But believe it or not, Philly's not quite ready to go with the national trend. So we have a mess, simply put. Judge, I, I want to take it back to you for a moment, because we've heard about a lot of reforms, um, like police reforms, creative solutions to a problem with bail in Pennsylvania, um, diver more diversion programs, all sorts of things that are very new to Philadelphia. And you do hear critics, um, police and, and some other groups that are critics of this administration saying, well, the sky is going to fall and there's going to be people running through the streets committing crimes. It was the same thing we heard when we were overhauling the bail system, uh, which didn't happen. Um, so my question to you is, has the sky fallen with, uh, with these reforms? And uh, what, are you, what are judges sort of seeing in their courtrooms? How different is it in the courtroom um, when you have these sort of more creative and more reform-minded re approaches to the criminal justice system? That's a great question. That gets to the culture of the courtroom and the culture among judges. When I was a public defender in the 70s, the culture among judges was put them on probation. And then when they violated after three years, put them on three more years. And then when they violated, put them on seven years. And you had people literally on 20 years probation. The trend in America then went to send them into jail, lock them up. And the courts are conservative and slow but eventually we get to what the public wants. And for the longest time, it was more and more with the DAs uh, egging it on to have longer and longer jail sentences. So the courts are not going to react very well to changes very quickly, just like Larry uh, just described. Uh, bail or sentencing or probation, it's going to take a cultural change among the judges thinking in order to get something done. It cannot be done in four years. And it can go back immediately uh, to the old system if there's a district attorney who wants to charge everybody to the maximum and uh, who values convictions. There's always been the concept that the district attorney isn't supposed to just get convictions. They're supposed to do justice in the courtroom. And uh, sadly, that's not really what I have seen among the district attorneys practicing in Philadelphia. Um, so the question really talks about the culture change, and it's not going to be uh, that easy or or quick. It's more more of a long haul uh, project, not a uh, instant change. So, uh, a, qu a question for um, Larry or Mike. Um, we heard mention of crime rates. And um, I think people are always quick to blame a DA when crime rates go up and quick to spread the praise around when crime rates go down. Um, what are the metrics in Philadelphia? What do they look like in terms of, of, of crime and the successfulness of these programs? Have you instituted metrics to, to show that the diversionary programs that you are doing are successful? And what is your response to any time there's any kind of an uptick in crime, it's somehow the DA's fault? You first, Mike. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Larry. Um, and Jennifer, I think it's also important to remember that one, Philadelphia is one of the most incarcerated places on the planet. Uh, we led the world in juvenile lifers sentenced to life without parole. Um, and that is the history to which Judge Bernstein is speaking. So when he's saying lock them up, I think it's important that we explicitly say he's talking about people that fit the demographic I recently aged out of, which would be uh, young African-American men. And that has caused seismic impacts on 
uh, cultures and communities within Philadelphia. So with that in mind, we are applying more equity, meaning that uh, we are trying to make decisions today conscious of the injustices of the past. So we are diverting more cases. We are diverting more people who might have been excluded because of prior criminal history, which is also steeped in racism, sexism, and classism. So we are being very proactive with that. And I think our consistent message has always been and will continue to be as progressive prosecutors, if we really want to address the motivations for crime, it's much more about addressing social determinants, like how many public schools are open, what is the funding level for those schools, what is the surrounding community and family structure for individuals who are thinking about um, engaging in criminal activity. And I think diversion really is uh, the gateway opportunity for us to take a step back as a criminal legal system and allow more community to control what public safety is and what makes us feel safe as individuals. Um, so things like substance use, uh, we say that addiction by medical definition means someone doing something despite adverse consequences. So what good is it if we invest in diversion programs that have negative consequences for people who still engage in their addictive behavior, whether that be substance use, whether that be violence, which is now seen theoretically through this lens of public health uh, and many other issues in, that come into our criminal legal system that probably shouldn't be there in the first place. So until we can create a robust public health response to public substance use or problematic substance use, until we can create the uh, moral tolerance for sex workers, we have no choice but to either decline arrests made by police in response to community complaints or concerns, or divert those individuals, and not just to another courtroom, but out of the criminal legal system as a signal to the rest of society um, to what the DA is talking about in that 80% uh, of progressive prosecutors are winning because this makes more sense because what we've done for the past hasn't really made us safer, hasn't lowered crime rates and has only criminalized uh, the existence even more so of low-income people, black and brown people, women and other people who feel marginalized. So to the extent that those people will still be arrested, um, I think we have a duty and obligation to create off-ramps for them while still screening through for the very few people who are drivers of uh, really violent crime or abhorrent behavior that might require a period of incarceration to wrap around the restorative process of treatment and services. DA Krasner, back to you. I thank you, Mr. Lee. And um, if there's extra time, I can only hope that Mr. Lee will, will render his famous uh, penguin story for all of you, which is not to be missed. I'm not kidding. It's a beautiful thing. It describes this movement. But anyway, um, so, you know, one of the things I really love about the parts of this film I've seen, and I, I have well, I, this mini series I've seen, and I had to see some of it to make sure that Ted wasn't going to get us all locked up for revealing things that are violations of the law. But one of the things I really loved is that I think it has the capacity to shake people's thinking around criminal justice, which has been very simplistic, because thank God it's not actually about me. It is about, uh, it is in many ways, uh, in the first episode or two, it's got something to do with me, but then a very quickly look, it turns into a broad portrait of several people in the office, including Mike Lee, including Bob Listenby, including Judge Temin, including Dana Basil and others who are trying to make this kind of momentous change and are feeling their way as they go. And then it gets even broader. Then it becomes a look at our opponents. You know, the judge who proudly says there is no mass incarceration. Really? Can I see those statistics? Or it's the, uh, you know, or it is T, this, uh, this person who has been supervised excessively by a system that is uh, crushing the future, right? Fascinating character. Latanya Myers, who becomes a bail navigator, also known as T. It becomes this much broader look, and it breaks down the simple way that you think about this. Why am I saying this? This is why. Because if you're a conservative prosecutor, 
and crime is going up, you're going to get reelected by saying, hit them harder, hang them higher, more of them in jail. Somehow, if you're a conservative prosecutor, crime goes up, you win because you get to yell even louder and claim you're going to lock them up. Nobody says, oh, you screwed up. All this tough talk, all this tough action made things worse. Nobody says that because we're also brainwashed a certain way. On the other hand, if you are a progressive prosecutor and crime indicators, even in one respect, are up, oh, my God, there's zombies running in the street. There's blood pouring down the gutter. It's all because of these progressive prosecutors. Ah, and some of that is going on right now, right? So that is one of the things I love about it is it, it tends to break up this idiotic comic book thinking about criminal justice. Here are, the, here are the facts in Philly, just in case you're amused, and I don't think I'm responsible for this, you know, positively or negatively, but let me just tell you the facts. The facts are crime is down a little bit in Philly during this administration. Violent crime, I repeat, violent crime as a category is down a little bit during this administration. Uh, during the what is up in Philly and across the entire country and basically every single big city in a way that is very disturbing and very troubling is during the pandemic, we've seen this big spike in gun homicides and in shootings that is alarming everyone. So you would think like with this broader context, with this picture that that's happening in every city, whether you have a traditional prosecutor, a Republican prosecutor, Democratic prosecutor, or a progressive prosecutor, you would think that this would mean, okay, we would now have sort of like an intel intelligent nuanced discussion which would be about what happens when you close down every single thing that juveniles and young adults do like organized sports, like camps, like rec centers, like open high school classrooms, things like that. But no, what you see, of course, is that people who want to politicize it, politicize it, and they go to the usual fraud, which is, oh my God, only in the cities where we have a progressive prosecutor. The bad thing is being caused by them, even though the truth is there's absolutely no correlation whatsoever between this gun violence spike and progressive prosecutors. If you want to look, read about that, look up John Pfaff, P-F-A-F-F. -F. He just put out something about it. I mean, those are the facts. You know, Philly's having a terrible time with gun violence, a 40% increase. That's the national average. That is the national average for the 34 largest cities. But it all gets politicized. It's all this mush where if you just keep screaming, hanging, hang them high, you're fine. And if you do something more nuanced than any, anything's not perfect, even if crime overall is down, violent crime overall is down, it's all your fault and you're causing blood to run in the streets. It's, that is how brainwashed we are. And that's why I'm, I'm really a fan of this eight part series because it makes you see it from all these different perspectives. And it makes you think about it in this way that is more complex. And you begin to realize that, you know, obviously the comic book left something out. Um, you're on, oh. Oh, actually, I'm, I'm sorry. I was actually going to jump in just yeah. one small thing on that point, because I think I think something that, you know, became maybe clear for uh, 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 myself, my co-director, our producers, just in making this project was something where, you know, of course, you're thinking about a lot more is just storytelling around criminal justice and how we tell the story and how we think about it. And I think a lot of a lot of um, the criminal justice storytelling is has historically been very simplistic very good guys and bad guys. And it's also, you know, our storytelling tradition is also highly emotion driven. And so whenever people hear stories around crime and the criminal justice system, a lot of it plays to emotion. And it's that conversation that I was, I think one of the things that culturally led to this idea of, oh, you're scared. If I say lock them up, then maybe you'll be less scared. Okay. Well, it sounds good to me. I'll vote for that person. And um, instead, you know, one of the things we had noticed that, you know, the progressive prosecutors are challenged with is trying to change that conversation. And, you know, one of the things we notice is that, like, even when, you know, in, in one of the episodes in the series, you see how um, the bail policy that they institute in episode one, a report comes out later on in the series that shows that it had no impact on, on crime, on recidivism. It actually was, it what they were hoping to happen happened essentially um, in the report. And so, you know, they try to tell the media that story and that's not the, that's not the story that people necessarily care about, you know, because, you know, but I don't feel safe because I see this thing happening or heard about this thing happening. And so it's, it's really difficult and it's not a criticism because on one, you know, on one hand, you know, 
you know, safety is a, is a personal thing. It's an emotional thing. It's hard to tell somebody to decide to feel safe. That's not something you can do. So I don't fault people for feeling unsafe, but I think part of the reason that people feel unsafe is just because of the storytelling that we do around it. And, you know, to change the conversation to be something that can be a bigger picture that can be, that can be based in analysis that can be based in fact, it's a really difficult change to make um, when, when everybody's used to talking about emotion. And I'm not sure we necessarily answer how to do that in, in the series, but it's definitely a question that we raise about how difficult that is, because it is something that we're going to be forced to do as a society if we're going to change anything, because we've been having that conversation and telling the stories the same way this whole time. And, and you know, this is where we are. Your Honor, I think you wanted to jump in, too. Yeah, going, going back to your question about the power of the district attorney, do they have too much power? The the power that they have is in the courtroom and they can uh, get rid of the minor cases that do nothing but clog up the system and focus on the people who are dangerous. But when it comes down to mental health services or addiction services or the root problems out in the neighborhoods, they have very little power except the moral force of being able to change the conversation and to change the story. And that is a very difficult thing, particularly when you have powerful forces in society that keep reinforcing the lock them up longer myth. So they are powerful in a certain way, and really not powerful in other important societal changes, except to try to change the conversation. And like I said before, it was remarkable to me that just by Larry changing the conversation by running on a different theme, changed the conversation, but it, it, it's a long-term process, not a quick fix at all. So I, I want to get at there's some questions coming in from the YouTube from the the other platform about um, police and policing and we we talked about that a little bit earlier. Um, someone put it bluntly in the chat and said, "Are you still in an adversarial position with the fraternal order of police?" Um, so I I would ask you that question, but also sort of more broadly, I know in New Jersey, we're trying to do police reform, we're trying to get more transparency from policing. And it seems like every time you ask police to be accountable, it somehow means that you're at odd with, odds with the police. And we saw that kind of coming up in the first episode, and even more so in the second episode, which I was really privileged to be able to see of the docu-series. Um, so why is it that if you want police to be more accountable and more transparent, that you are somehow put in this bucket of being at odds with the police? And how do you reconcile that? So it's a great question, but I think, I think it's very important to talk about what we mean when we say the police, because the head of the Fraternal Order of Police is not a cop, has not been a cop for a very long time. Um, and, you know, in many ways, he's completely at odds with the commissioner. The truth about our fraternal orders of police, our brotherhoods, which they're all called because they all have anti-union misogynist names, the truth, about because they used to put down protests, in case you all forgot, but the truth about them is that they are run by their retired membership. The fraternal order of police in Philly is close to 20,000 people, but there are only 6,500 active officers. So who do you think are the rest of the votes? for who's the leadership? Well, think a minute about who those retired people are. They're coming from, uh, from in Philly, the Frank Rizzo era or the post Frank Rizzo era, which was all about racism and brutality in very, very explicit terms. Um, it was all about an extremely hang em high approach, right? So if that's the retired membership determining the, leader, determining the leadership, then don't be surprised when you have the heads of unions all over the country talking crazy right wing talk I mean, in Philly, they've endorsed Donald Trump twice without taking a vote of the membership. And they have done so for a city where seven out of eight voters are Democrats, a city that hates Donald Trump. They are out of touch in the leadership of the FOP with Philadelphia, but they're also out of touch with the, the current modern active 
membership because we have far more women in our police department. We have far more people of color than we used to have. We have people whose life experiences are quite different. They may be 22 years of age and they've had a brother who died of a heroin overdose. They're seeing addiction differently than it was seen during the war on drugs. They're open to things that they weren't open to before, right? So I say that because I think it's an important distinction. I am not going to get along with the current head of the FOP. If I did, I should quit. This is a guy who has beers with the Proud Boys in the officers only section of the FOP, lies about it, and then gets exposed by the Proud Boys on social media because they're proud and they put up the pictures. This is a guy who in 2017 uh, did a press conference in which he said, that Black Lives Matter is a, quote, pack of rabid animals, unquote. This is a guy who defends police officers in uniform with exposed and visible Nazi tattoos. No, I will not be getting along with that man. My father served in World War II. I don't do Nazis, okay? But that is a completely different issue than the very amiable and constructive conversation I had with Danielle Outlaw, the African-American woman who is only 42 or three and who is the head of the Philadelphia Police Department in which we brought about yet another form of collaboration that I think goes towards uh, doing a better job and having more integrity. In many ways, I'm helping Daniel Outlaw against John McNesby because when she fires somebody, she wants them to stay fired. And if it just so happens, she wants them to stay fired because of, of a crime, the surest way for them to stay fired is for me to prosecute them and get them convicted because there is a whole pack of sleazy arbitrators. They are ready to put cops back in the department no matter what she does as the chief but they can't do it if, if there's a conviction. Um, you know, it, it, there is a real difference between being adverse to the crazy right wing forever, forever Republican and forever all white leadership of the FOB and being adverse to active Philadelphia police officers, many of whom want to uh, want their organization to be respected. They want it to have integrity. They want witnesses to come forward. They want to do community policing. I think we're doing a pretty good job of getting closer and closer to the best kind of police officers in Philadelphia. We will never we will never uh, be, be uh, you know, pinky swearing and drinking beers with the Proud Boys in the officers only section of FOP Hall with John McNesby. A question for Ted, um, do future episodes of the series address the biases um, and the distinctions between um, the, the officers who are serving now and Fraternal Order of Police? Are, are these themes that are going to be explored and addressed in future episodes? Uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, the relationship with the police kind of uh, continues as we go forward in episode two. So episode one ends uh, with the discovery of the police, uh, what becomes the police misconduct database. Um, and so in episode two, that relationship between uh, the office and the police is really kind of the cent central to the story. And um, there's there's a big explanation about kind of what Larry just gave us uh, about the difference between the, the relationship with the police as an institution itself, as a, as a government agency and the police union, what that history is in Philadelphia, what the difference is. Um, but then we kind of see how that relationship is gonna play out going forward. In the following episode, um, we're gonna look at a case of a police officer who um, died in the line of duty very heroically, um, all, all captured on, on video, uh, the suspects uh, captured at the scene, no question about who did it. Um, and um, the officer basically sacrificed himself um, for to to save a store full of people. And um, and but we see how in that case that very beloved officer um, kind of how the, the the case around uh, his murder becomes very politicized around the idea of the death penalty. Um, and uh, during during uh, the campaign, uh, Larry, uh, you know talked about never seeking the death penalty, um, taking that, you know, changing the practice of the office in regards to that. And, you know, the Fraternal Order of Police takes that idea, especially in this case, as an affront to all law enforcement everywhere. And, and it, you know, becomes, it, it becomes kind of interesting examination on just kind of like what the, uh, the emotional, you know, what the symbolism of the death penalty has become in Philadelphia in regards to policing, and even just in regards to the criminal justice system, this idea of taking a life and how in some ways it's, it's, be, it's become, it's had this idea attached to it that it's cathartic for victims, that it's good for victims if, if, if a person's life is taken in the criminal justice system through prosecution. And so we kind of look at that from all different sides and unpack that. And then later on, we'll see how 
you know, um, messaging um, works in the community when the DA's office is like working on getting their messaging out about what they're doing in their prosecution. But then we see the, how, you know, the, uh, the fraternal of police and the police officers, you know, are getting a different message out in the community that, you know, may be spinning the story a different way. And how do you, how do you deal with that? Um, and then later on in the series, we see what happens when a police officer is prosecuted for murder and how difficult it can be when um, a prosecutor's office who is seeking that conviction, what happens, uh, how difficult it is, um, even, even when the case has a video evidence and has a lot of components that would, on the surface, make it look like a very strong case. So, so it's, it's a long way of saying yes. Uh, we look at that relationship a lot in the series and from many different angles, including actually uh, with a character who the audience will meet later, who um, is a police officer. And so we get to know a police officer really well in the in the series. And uh, we try to see things from his perspective and spend a lot of time hanging out with him. And he happens to work in the area where he grew up, which is one of the areas, uh, it's the area in Philadelphia that's probably hardest hit by the opioid epidemic and um, is, is dealing with a lot of its own issues. And um, so there's a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of things we look at from a lot of different angles as, as much as possible in regards to policing. So we're getting a, a couple of more questions about issues related to to bail, um, but more kind of sort of general questions about um, what do you do with people who are have been released without bail who who are repeat offenders that they keep committing offenses? Do you release them again? How do you make those assessments? And another question about around um, bails for misdemeanors and um, and how you how you kind of make decisions about what misdemeanors um, you decided to let go of bail and not ask for cash bail on, and um, how you how do you address people who repeat repeatedly commit those offenses? So I, I, I is that for me? Was that the was I the okay? Yes. Sir. Um, all right. Thank you. So, you know, a lot of smart people in the office, and I think Mike was in, in the mix on all this, came up with the idea that in order to reduce the number of broke people who sit in jail just because they're broke for non-serious stuff, they, we would try to identify the lowest hanging fruit, the, the stuff that was easiest for us to uh, successfully advocate. So we picked offenses that were not violent, that were misdemeanors, and that... Um, were offenses where judges historically had given low bails, but they had still given bails. Uh, so, you know, picking that group, we weren't asking judges to stretch all that much by going to no bail. And picking that group, we knew that we weren't dealing with some of the more troubling and serious misdemeanors. I mean, you know, indecent assault can actually be pretty serious because it can be an indication of more serious sexually predatory behavior. Uh, a, simple, a simple assault, meaning a fight in which you point a gun at another person, but you don't fire it. That is pretty serious, but that can also, at least at certain times it has been, can be a simple assault, right? So, you know, to a large extent, we have always made all of our policies the opposite of mandatory sentencing. Every single policy is a presumption. We always allow for the possibility of an exception. And I think this answer maybe goes to the other question. All right, you know, you know the, the progressives are going to say, well, if you are uh, someone who is suffering from addiction or you have mental health issues and you just keep breaking into cars and you just keep taking all the change out of the cars, but you're ransacking the place and you're taking, you know, purses when you find them, you can't just let people out so that they do it 20 times the next day and then they get locked up and get freed and they do it 20 times the next day. And the answer is no, you can't. When you, if you have someone who uh, whose behavior is perpetually committing the same crime over and over and over again, there comes a point where the argument becomes: maybe you got to sit in jail with your twenty open breaking and entering cases for cars. Maybe you got to sit in jail until we get you in front of a judge and then figure out what it is you really need. Whether that is, you know, some some kind of inpatient long term drug treatment, some kind of mental health assistance and medication, you're not getting whatever it may be. But those are really rare. It's, it's really exceptional. We, you know, we got the data on what happened with our bail policy. No, people didn't stop showing up for court. No, they weren't committing a bunch of crimes. And when we look to see which of these folks who got out on these low level offenses committed the same or a similar offense within a year, 
it was a very small percent. It was some, if I recall correctly, it was like 1% or maybe 5%. Maybe it was 1% that would do an offense two times within the next year, right? So, you know, the big picture remains, the presumption remained. What really was happening overall is offenses for which you would have gotten out if you had a job or if you had a friend or if you were rich, you were going to get out if you were broken homeless too, which is how it should be. Nobody should be sitting in jail for 135 bucks a day paid by taxpayers because they can't pay a hundred dollars. I guess that just don't make no sense, simply put. So, uh, so the big picture remains, but you know, we believe in individual justice and that does mean that there are exceptions to every rule. If you catch Pablo Escobar and he, he this time he didn't have machine guns and skeletons in his trunk, but he did jaywalk. Well, maybe Pablo's the exception. Maybe we're going to try to keep Pablo on the jaywalking because we don't need any more skeletons uh, in, in, in trunks of cars. And I'm okay with that. It's called individual justice. And uh, Jennifer, the only thing I would add very quickly is that those 25 charges are about 52% of our caseload when we looked over the five-year average. So it also was a way to uh, alleviate some of the issues that other um, panelists had brought up earlier. Uh, and I think it has made a difference in just reducing the prison population and the increasing the perception of fairness within our criminal justice system. And the other thing I would say is that it also has an unintended benefit of allowing us to see who are the opportunistic or professional thieves who do know very closely what the DAO policy is, because I think there's another comic book narrative that uh, people who commit crimes are only sophisticated when they're reading the DAO policy and basing their decision making based off that. So I'm, I'm stealing under $500 because that's what DA Krasner's policy says I'm allowed to take, but every other aspect of their life, that person is not seen as intelligent enough to uh, function or do whatever in life. So there is a lot of that narrative as well around prolific offenders being acutely aware uh, and fully comprehensive of what DAO policies are. And we haven't really seen that play out in reality. So uh, we've we've been going an hour, so we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up in, in just a moment. Um, I do want to um, ask one more question, just one more question to Larry about. Um, there's in the first episode, there is this conversation that you have with your wife about. Um, I've been complaining about this for all of these years, and now all of a sudden it is happening. Now I'm in this position to do something about it and to do something about the prosecutor's office and this system. Um, do you ever say, what am I doing or how, do you love it? Um, the, the conversation I remember with my wife is the one where she's making fun of me for not talking about my emotions, which, <laughs> which Ted not only relished, but edited into it. So um, thank you to everyone involved in that scenario. But uh, I, uh, yeah, I do say, what am I doing? And I do love it. Both of those things are true. It is unquestionably the most important job I've ever had. It is uh, on most days, the best job I've ever had because we see sweeping change. We really do. And we're so lucky to be part of a national movement, not just to be watching history pass us by, but to be part of it. You know, that is really fascinating. Now, having said that, having an office of 600 people has proved the adage of a, a friend of mine, a progressive prosecutor from Durham, North Carolina, by Satana DeBerry, and that adage is people ruin everything. I will tell you, any assortment of 600 people, including law-abiding prosecutors and their law-abiding staff, they can do the crazy. So there are some days when I come in and, oh my goodness, you know, I spend more of my time dealing with um, the, the diverse aspects of human frailty than I do uh, the big picture, uh, how we fix criminal justice. I could, some of those days I could, you know, miss. But for the most part, I think it's absolutely wonderful. And, and Mike Lee is laughing because he knows exactly what I'm talking about. And we both know we can't really talk about it. Well, I want to thank everyone for being here. Uh, Judge Mark Bernstein, the filmmaker, Ted Kass, and Mike Lee, Larry Krasner for this discussion. And I think the big takeaway for me, uh, again, as a lifelong public defender is 
the power of the stories. And we talked earlier about, you know, prosecutors being able to frame a new narrative, judges hearing that narrative in the courtroom and wonderful filmmakers like Ted, who are making the story so that those of us who don't work within the justice system every single day, day in, day out, can start to understand it and to sort of come along on this movement that all of us have been working towards um, all our lives. So I, I wanna thank all of you for the work that you do. Uh, I wanna thank you for being here. Thank you, Ted and, and your team for telling this story. Um, and thank you for sharing all of your thoughts with us this evening. Um, and to everyone watching at home, thank you for your, your thoughtful questions. Philly DA will premiere on your local PBS station on Tuesday, April 20th, and it will be running for eight weeks. Um, I, I was lucky enough to see both the first and second episodes. You definitely do not want to miss it. So tune in um, to your local PBS station starting Tuesday, April 20th. Thank you all so much and have a great night.